we'll now move on to our, our next speaker, Dr. Akanyemi Oni Orison, who's an assistant professor at the Department of Clinical Pharmacy at the University of California, San Francisco. All right, thank you. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, morning in the, on, the, on the West Coast. Um, my name is Akanyemi Oni Orison. I am an assistant professor in the School of Pharmacy at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, thank you for the invitation to uh, discuss my perspectives and my work. And um, the, the title of my talk is Population Descriptors and Genomic Research, um, Achieving Positive Outcomes for All. So um, in preparing slides for this session, um, the first thing that I did was think about why this is so important to address. And what I ultimately came up with um, is that the purpose of this exercise, at least as far as my work goes, is to advance health equity you know, for groups historically marginalized in this country. Um, of course, there are many ways that we can help to advance this. Um, the main point I will argue in my talk is that I truly do not believe um, that we can productively discuss population descriptors in a silo without addressing some of, of these other things at the same time. So uh, I'll try my best to explain that position um, in this short amount of time, um, but I will you know, discuss some of the work I do as well. So, so I have an ongoing collaboration with Kaiser Permanente Research Biobank, which um, contains uh, RPGH and, and JIRA. Um, JIRA is a cohort of about 100,000 participants. All of these individuals have genome-wide genotyping data and comprehensive um, inpatient and outpatient electronic health records that cover all aspects of medical care, laboratory prescription, um, dispensing records, ICD codes. Um, and then participants were also given a, um, a survey to, to capture um, information such as income, education, um, employment, sexuality, et cetera. So um, one population descriptor that we have in the cohort is, is essentially this. So um, participants were essentially given 23 options and were asked to select any groups which applied to them. And so you can see that, you know, you kind of see the numbers for yourself. Um, and you can see that there was an other category. Participants who selected this could then specify in free form. So this, there was a free form option. Um, we also have uh, self-reported race ethnicity data as shown. And again, you can see the numbers. Participants could select more than one option for either of these descriptors. And again, notice the uneven numbers across the groups. So regardless of which descriptor, um, that we're talking about, there's uneven numbers. We have 14 participants who consider themselves Samoan, for example. So we have to kind of work with the, the numbers that we get. So we also characterize this um, JIRA participants based on principal components. And I have a few things to say about this. So, you know, first um, you can see the, the kind of the distribution here. Um, this doesn't quite capture all of the genetic variation here. I mean, there's other components that further separate individuals. But the most important thing to me is that regardless of whether we're talking about continuous or, or not, you know, for them, and this is applies, I would say, for the majority of, of cohorts in this country, even the ones that are the most, you know, considered to be the most diverse, there is an uneven distribution. So this is a heat map and, um, you, you know, you can see if you include every, so essentially if you include everyone together in one analysis, the results are going to be more generalizable to individuals that are closer to the hotspot on the continuum. I personally would not be close to this hotspot. So, I mean, again, this is without any population. We don't have no population descriptors here. Just gen, gen, uh, you know, genetic similarity, and we see that there's still an unevenness, regardless of, of, of what we use. So, um, now I can describe how, how Jared was recruited. So, we talked about, um, you know, we, we started with the, this KPNC, Kaiser Permanente Northern California, 
and this is at, at the time of recruitment in 2007. Um, as I mentioned, all members who had been members for a long enough period of time were sent a survey. And um, they had about, about 150,000 of the K KPNC, of, of the RPGH participants. There's actually uh, about 400,000 RPGH participants, but about 150,000 completed the survey and provided the saliva sample. There were only enough resources to extract DNA at the time from 100,000 of, of RPGH. And, and again, that's what made JIRA. So they started with, um, they essentially, how they did this was that they started with the samples from individuals that, that did not identify as non-Hispanic white. Okay, so there was actually 20,000 participants who did not identify as, as um, non-Hispanic white. Um, and, and then for the remaining 80,000 spots, they randomly selected from the 130,000 participants who, or remaining who, had, who identified as white in the cohort. Okay, so if they had just done this randomly, selected from the cohort, there would have been um, an even more uneven distribution in the PC plot that I just showed. Okay. So this brings me to my next point. So descriptors, um, you know, need to be applicable, in my perspective, to the full spectrum of the research process. The purpose of genomics research, or at least the research that I do, is to advance human health. So we can't have descriptors here, in my opinion, that, um, that uh, but then when it's time to recruit participants, we have to resort to an entirely different set of um, descriptors. Um, that pretty much defeats the purpose. Um, and then we have to also have a sense of generalizability of the results that we produce when it comes time to patient care. So we can't really talk about population descriptors for genomics research in a vacuum without kind of considering this full spectrum. So I do pharmacogenomics research, and a major aspect of my work with this cohort and working with the EHRs is to generate drug response phenotypes that are robust and that are accurate. And that's what I spend most of my time doing. That's the, actually that's the, the most time-consuming aspect of my work. And um, recently, I've been I've been focusing on the pharmacogenetics of, of stand therapy. Stand therapy, by the way, are um, the most common one of the most one of the most common medications that is that are used in the United States throughout, you know, period. So we um, stratified, you know, by these socially constructed race ethnicity groups, as shown. And after applying our, um, you know, strict, you know, criteria, and this was for a, uh, a statin myocardial infarction genetic study, you know, we have this, this criteria for um, the definition of an adherent statin user, et cetera, and we have, and we have these well-characterized phenotypes, these are the numbers that we get. And, you know, um, and again, this is kind of just shows that the numbers get even smaller when we start to do, we can't, we, you know, obviously our analyses don't apply to the full cohort. They apply to only the subset of, for example, subset of those who use stands. Again, this is one of the most common therapies used in the cohort. And uh, this does not match, at, and by any means, the, the census numbers when it comes to um, the, the population of, of California. So, um, you know, the, one of the questions, why not just pull all those, all the samples together? Why not just pull all the samples together? So, you know, even after analyst control for, you know, socioeconomic indicators, um, they frequently observe a, a greater risk of, of adverse health outcomes among black Americans and racial ethnic differences in response to treatments are partially related to biological factors, including genetic and epigenetic variants. So what I take away from why we can't, you know, basically we, we can't just pull the samples together because we kind of lose some of, we lose information. I think uh, uh, we ultimately need larger sample sizes in, especially in historically excluded groups. And we need to account for as many factors as possible. As you can see, there's multiple factors that can account for some of these um, uh, differences. And so these factors include genetic factors, social determinants of health, exposures to structural racism, for example, how that manifests bio, uh, biologically, epigenetics, et cetera. So 
In my eyes, we need to look at all, all the factors. So this is an example. Essentially, the state of, of Hawaii um, has a large population of individuals who consider themselves to be um, uh, uh, Pacific Islanders or of East Asian descent. So, you know, without any genotyping, um, someone in my field knows that a proportion of, of basically that um, the proportion of, of non-responders to clopidogrel, to Plavix, um, for treating heart attacks, uh, for treating um, stent thrombosis, um, is, is, can be as high as 70% in, for some of these groups. So Bristol Myers Squibbs, they knew that. They ignored that information. They pushed the therapy in the state of Hawaii, and it had consequences. And so to me, this is a, a major public health failure to, um, to, to, to accurately um, to, to withhold information and to use that to kind of uh, benefit um, in terms of uh, uh, marketing the, the therapy. Um, and this to me is a consequence of structural racism. So, you know, we take findings in self-identified white participants, extrapolate that to other groups, and they, that can cause harm. So removing population descriptors um, and essentially, you all, what, what happens inherently is that we kind of tend to, to, to apply the, the results from the, the, the most populated um, group. And why? And that's because, again, we have the unequal, uneven sample sizes that I showed. So another, um, a, a, another really important critical point that I wanted to share is that um, when we come up, you know, there's, there's all, you know, differing views on, on this topic. And um, when we uh, are trying to come up with, with solutions for complex issues such as this one, I think we often underscore the importance of, of lived experience in shaping perspective. And I can use myself as a case example. So my training certainly impacts my thoughts on this topic. My, my clinical uh, you know, experience, my, my, my um, training as a student, and, and et cetera. The first 10 to 12 years of my life plays a role. I'm from the communities that we're, we're trying to protect. And that's something that you know, I, I, I take to heart and when I'm doing the work I do. And I've had so many situations in academia <clears throat> where I'm, you know, the optics are made to look like I'm being supported, but it's actually, to me, just a performance. And so that impacts my thoughts. And so that, those are the kind of things that shape perspective. And I, I really want the audience to understand that, that this is not just a, 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 a right or wrong issue, for example. So this is the first paper, to my knowledge, that acknowledges that lived experiences impact perspective. I you know, recently read a paper, Getting Genetic Ancestry Right for Science and Society. And my thoughts are that there's nothing really right or wrong about someone's lived experience. You know, um, I've been, over the past couple of years, I've been called wrong on my perspective. I've been called stupid uh, as recently as a, a few months ago. Um, and actually by an author on that paper that I talked about. So. You, I, don't, I just don't, you, you can't improve, prove my lived experience wrong. You know, if you disagree, that's fine. But, you know, don't, don't throw shade on someone's lived experience. Um, especially if you've never had that experience or you've never had the professional training or that clinical expertise. So this illustrates to me why I don't think that this, we can discuss this topic as a standalone. I could show more of my work. I could talk, I can, you know, have a lot of more pharmacogenomic examples that, you know, would support my thoughts. Um, but I'd really only be saying things that have already been said by many, many people. So I, I think that we really kind of need to, to step back and, um, and focus on the outcome again. So, you know, trying to, to improve this right here at the detriment of, of all these other things in red, to me, is counterproductive. So, you know, if you, for example, want to advance health equity, why not reach out and champion the career of someone who has a different perspective than you? 
um, and I'm d talking directly to the leaders of the field when I when I say that. So um, summary, you know, examining the use of, of population descriptors in genomics research cannot be done as a standalone discussion item for the reasons I, I discussed. You know, this goes along with the idea that population descriptors need to be relevant to the full spectrum, um, the full translational uh, spectrum, research practice, um, uh, uh, you know, recruitment, um, et cetera, as I showed. Um, this is not a discussion of right versus wrong. This is a discussion of different perspectives. And it's about kind of making a, a concerted effort to, um, to find a common ground and move forward on, on that sense. Um, so I, 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 I wholeheartedly believe that, um, that, that one's perspective is impacted by their lived experience and shaped by that. And, um, you know, from my perspective, when we talk about descriptors, we need to really focus on the outcomes um, rather than just the optics. So with that, I have these acknowledgments. Um, you know, I like to take the time to kind of uh, acknowledge my mentors, coaches, colleagues um, who have really taken the time to provide guidance, uh, exchange ideas with me one-on-one -on -one over the past year or so. Um, not all of them disagree, or sorry, not all of them agree with me, but um, I think that they all believe that diverse perspectives are important in this field. And um, I would say that these individuals have definitely had a positive impact on my career as it relates to this topic. And um, it's kind of given me a sense of, of belonging and purpose in, in, with my work. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Takanyami. Thank you.